All right. Hey, it's me again. All right. So, we begin the day two in an excellent way with uh, Dr. Michael Stevens. Uh, I'm going to briefly read his bio here. Uh, Michael Stevens is an assistant professor at the School of Information at San Jose University. He was the 2009 CAVAL Visiting Scholar in Australia, consulted and presented for U.S. embassies in Germany, Switzerland, and Turkey, and presents to both national and international audiences about emerging technologies, learning, innovation, and libraries. Since 2010, Dr. Stevens has written a monthly column, Office Hours, for Library Journal, exploring the issues, ideas, and emerging trends in libraries and allies education. I'm particularly glad that he's here because I believe this is the first time we've met in person on U.S. soil. Right? That is true. Yes. yes. That is Salzburg, true. I think, was the last time. So yes. um, I'm, a, I'm a big Michael Stevens fan. Um, we, we moved. Uh, it, it was like parallel play. We sort of did do different librarianship MOOCs at the same time and in very different ways. And I think what's been great about that experience is learning from each other. And one of the things, besides having an excellent advocate for libraries and an eloquent advocate for libraries, is what I hope you're hearing that Michael certainly represents is an optimism about librarianship and libraries. The, the doom and gloom and shaking fingers about will we exist and you must do this stuff, I feel is increasingly being replaced by optimism and opportunity. And this is something that I think very few people represent better than Michael. So, with that, I will shut up and hand it over. David, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. I'm going to stay down here. Is that okay? So I might walk around and come right up close to this camera. And we'll be talking to our friends out there as well. And there's a camera there. Hi. And some of you are probably tweeting. This is fun. How cool is this? This is my third time in this room, or maybe my, I think so, I think, yeah, I, I, well, I saw, I was like, yeah, I remember this, I, I have been here before for various things. Um, so it's very nice to be back with you all, it's nice to, to be able to chat with you all in this room as well as uh, our colleagues in the other states. I'm going to dive right in and uh, watch the time uh, closely. Uh, today we're going to talk a bit about learning, but let me tell you a little bit about where I'm coming from. And David, thank you for that introduction. I teach for San Jose State University School of Information. We are a 100% online LIS program. So the super cool thing is I do not live in California. I live in the great state of Michigan. And I get to do this all the time because I like to do this, to say I live right up here <laughs> in, uh, near Traverse City. So we have this, which is absolutely wonderful, um, but we also have this, and I think they're changing the Michigan State motto after the last couple of winters we've had to winter is coming. <laughs> I show this in Florida and people are like, <gasps> I took this to Alaska this spring and they're like, eh. <laughs> so fun. All right, so let's talk a bit about how the world has changed. And I was watching from afar yesterday to see the conversation streams attached to your hashtag. And I really think what I have to say today sort of falls in line with what you heard yesterday and probably what you will experience today and into tomorrow. So I think that that always makes me happy when you come together, all this planning and all these people speaking, and, and the threads are so synchronous. So the world has changed. A few things have happened. Technology, of course, the way we can communicate, the way we think about the world, the way we think about each other. Arthur C. Clarke said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Think about the magical devices that we carry around. Think about the magic that is enabled by the Internet by the web, and I've long said the web has changed everything, and it really has, and we'll see some examples of that. This was pretty magical back in the day. This is Grand Valley State University uh, in the great state of Michigan, and I, I want to say this is 1980-something, and this is Grand Valley State, at that time, college computer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
it's kind of hard to see, and I'm sorry for the folks uh, following along from afar, but it says some games you may enjoy there off to the side on the computer, uh, including tic-tac-toe, blackjack, and, pardon me, crafts. So that, that was sort of a magical device in the library back in whatever year, 1980, whatever. And we're still offering access to magic. Okay, big, giant, wordy quote from Thomas Friedman uh, from The World is Flat. The key here, and one of the reasons that I think you all are here participating in this program, is you're excited about this, about learning how to learn, about how to be adaptable in this constantly changing world. Our skills have to adapt and continuously adapt, and that's why it's important to keep learning. I tell my students, the minute that I stop learning or I stop challenging myself, I need to pack up my virtual office and go sell tomatoes on the highway because I'm not going to be of use to anyone in my job. So there's some challenges, though, let's talk about before we uh, dive into uh, the learning part. Uh, <laughs> this is a challenge. I like to eavesdrop. I was on the bus today. I was eavesdropping a little bit, and I'll come back to that. I was at PLA a few years ago, Public Library Association meeting, and I'm listening in the hotel bar, and this table full of librarians. What is the table full of librarians called? A murmur? No. A consortium. A what? A consortium. A consortium of librarians at the table. And one of them said so clearly, every time people really like something, we get rid of it. Has that happened in your library? Oh, it's too popular. <laughs> oh, I was, we got to put a, a policy on this. <laughs> this is a challenge. <clears throat> yeah. Have you said this lately? I hope not. I kid you not, 10 years ago, I was running my mouth in front of librarians, and I had a slide, real ugly PowerPoint slide, you know, 10 years ago, forgive me. <laughs> Bullet, 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 five things I never want to hear in libraries again, and one of them was this. I'm at ALA in Las Vegas last year. Never again. It was so hot. And I heard it there. Well, we've always done it this way, and we can't change that procedure. Like, wait a minute, come on, 10 years. Don't let this uh, send your way. It's really hard to see down here. These are URLs for all. I'm sort of citing things as I go along. It's kind of hard to see, but uh, the slides are available. You can download them. I also put up on the, the iLead website, all the, as a comment, all the, the links as well. This is from a column I wrote called Always Doesn't Live Here Anymore. All right. So OK, hold on to your hats, and I'm sorry for this. It's OK. This is from the Librarian Shaming Tumblr. This is where librarians do their true confessions. This one went up. I want to replace all librarians with tech people with great customer service skills and teaching ability. I want the library to have its own genius bar. Wow. That's a little daunting and a little irksome, especially coming from one of our own, right? So keep, keep that in mind. So here's some approaches to change. Uh, Wonderful book by Clay Shirky. I would urge you to read this one. Uh, he writes about how people spend their time in this connected world much differently than we used to, like when I was growing up in the 70s and 80s, and you watched TV at night, and it was very passive activity, and now things are much more participatory. But Shirky says there are three ways that we might approach change and technological change and all of these things in society. I think we can apply it to our institutions. The first way is as much chaos as we can stand. The second way is traditionalist approval. And that's where we go through the traditional channels. The library website goes to marketing because that's what it is and it really isn't. The third way is a negotiated transaction. And that's where all the stakeholders come together and we talk about things and we make decisions. What do you think Clay Shirky advocates for? For the room, for the folks out there, what do you think? I heard it. <laughs> Don't be shy. Yes, thank you. It's chaos. 
as much chaos as we can stand. And this is kind of daunting too, isn't it? It's a little scary. Here's how it makes sense to me. It's that last bit, as much chaos as we can stand. Meaning, we can say as a group, and we can say this today, we're going to handle as much chaos as possible that we can stand within the confines of what we're doing. And it's going to be messy. And we're going to learn. And we're going to make mistakes. And that's okay. And I might mess up in front of everybody, and that's okay too. That's part of chaos. And we can say that as an organization. You can even say that as an individual. And I think that, and I try to remind myself, of that sometimes, and I'm beating myself up for, for uh, things that uh, I stumble over. So, what is the new normal? What I see right now is an evolving landscape of learning and experience in the library. And when I say learning, I mean multiple ways. And this is a beautiful quote um, from, hello, just went out of my mind. Have to look at it here from, uh, Mobile Learning Environments from Educost by David Gagnon. Learning happens anywhere someone has questions and the means to explore answers. That really uh, points toward the title of my talk and the, the sort of bandwagon I've been on, the learning everywhere idea. This is this. This is learning, very formal, kind of similar to what we're doing here. A little daunting to see a room full of laptop coding students, isn't it? Think of the back channel going on uh, in that room, in the tweets or whatever. Uh, informal learning, and that's all the learning that we facilitate or participate in that happens across the desk, out in the stacks, at the cafeteria, at the student commons, wherever you happen to be, at the Panera Bread in your community, for those librarians that have sometimes set up a library uh, laptop and a little sign that says, get your library card here. It can be very informal. It can also be unexpected. Ugh, I'm sorry. I apologize to the vegetarians in the room. I'm a vegetarian too, and I'm facing this way, so I don't have to look at it. <laughs> it's icky, but what it is, is Johnson County Public Library, one of my favorite, favorite public libraries right now, in the great state of Kansas, they did the Books and Butchers program. And this is Sean Casserly leading a wonderful, wonderful group of, of folk down there in his library. There are famous butchers in Kansas. Who knew? Who knew? What do you do? You bring them in to do a program and butcher a side of beef while you talk about it. Uh, Sean sent me these photos. I think this is pretty cool. Um, where was I? I think it was in, I spoke to uh, Alaska, as I told you. And the lady like raises her hand during my talk and she says, look, 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 look at all the men. She said, I can't get men in our public programs to save my life. So we said, well, maybe, <laughs> maybe butchering might bring them in. Maybe serving beer might bring them in, beer and beef or whatever. This is unexpected learning. Then there's that type of, of learning that's based in curiosity. And maybe you've experienced this, where you're like, oh, well, that's interesting. I didn't know about that. Or what about this? And then suddenly, you turn to your device. Or maybe you call the library and talk to the reference librarian. But I think you probably turn to your device, and you do some searching. That's what people do. And you find some things, and you read about it, and you learn a bit. That's a very interesting type of learning to me. And it used to be in libraries that we did this very well. I need to read about growing plants or whatever. And you would go to the library and you would go to that number. Maybe somebody would help you go to that number and you'd pull a couple of books off the shelf and you'd sit at a big table in a big room and you would learn in the warehouse. It is much, much different now. There are also new ways to learn. Uh, this is a... A sign from a classroom where uh, the games have been, been pulled out because the computers are for educational purposes only. Some people would say that games can be educational, and there's a whole school of thought around that. So this is a kind of a silly sign. Because then there's this, and this is Minecraft. This is Minecraft at Darien Library. Uh, a wonderful article by John Blyberg. I think I think the URL got cut off. It's right down below. Um, a wonderful article in School Library Journal about the library's Minecraft community. 
and what Lyberg and the other library folk are doing there to encourage the young people inside of Minecraft to, to be building sort of a replica of Darien in mm -hmm. Darien, Connecticut. Very interesting. Because we really are uh, encountering a new generation of learners. And I, I tell this story a lot. I'm going to tell it to you all. Um, where we stay in the summertime up north, um, we share our, our Wi-Fi. Nobody tweet that. Please don't tweet that. And it's recorded. It's fine. Shh. Sorry. So our neighbor, I look out the window, and there's Ian. And I was just with Ian this past weekend. He was up. And he's, he's older now. But he was like eight. And I look, and he's like this. I said, Ian, what are you doing? And he said, I'm downloading apps. Who's eight? And his mom and dad had said he could download anything free he wanted onto the, the family iPod Touch. Think of the world, and Ian being eight, that are now 11, that he's going to grow up in. And think of the world that he will graduate from high school in and move on to university. How things will be even more different than they are now with the way our devices are so uh, ingrained in our lives, which we'll see in just a second. So really, to me, this is a great opportunity uh, to share all the cool stuff we have, to share ourselves, as well as to offer access to all of the cool stuff we have. How are we doing? You guys all right? Mm -hmm. Okay. I like the thumbs up. Thank you. I appreciate that. And then there's this, just real quick. I was at a uh, hotel bar the night before a talk in a faraway southern state and I was talking to the bartender and he was uh, running the music in the bar off of his phone and uh, he played some songs I liked and we talked about music and we talked about our devices and uh, he said yeah I got everything I need and because we have Wi-Fi here he's, he's constantly easily connected he said I have my web and my email and my text and my video I have the world of information in my hand I said, wow, I'm going to talk to a room full of librarians tomorrow, and I'm going to tell them that. This was a couple, three years ago, and I think we see this uh, continue to be such an important part of how we provide access. Uh, Pew Internet and American Life found that for many people, the f our phones have become an extension of ourselves and fully incorporated into the rhythm of our lives. I was very lucky to go to uh, IFLA in France this past summer, last year, and uh, do a couple of talks. And I spent 12 wonderful hours in Paris with uh, friends that I actually had never met. I had known them online for many years. They collected me at my hotel and took me on a whirlwind tour through the Louvre. This is how you consume art in 2014. I don't know if this is good or bad, but there's a lot of this and moving into the room. So we went to the room where the Mona Lisa was. If you've been there, it's a throng. It's a giant square room, and you can see way over in the end this little postage stamp on the wall, and that's the painting. It's an incredible bit. You walk in, and all the, the hands go up. Other good example, I saw Fleetwood Mac on tour. Yay, so good. They're in Europe right now. The chain starts, you know, the first song. What happens at concerts now? Up go the phones. I don't know, are they calling people? Are they recording? Or, Listen, it's Stevie. You know, like. <laughs> so interesting to me. This, and this, this is the way the world is, for good or for bad. Which brings me, and you may be thinking about this, well, you need to unplug it. You need to like, put the phone away and enjoy the music. A wonderful article from The New Yorker called The Pointlessness of Unplugging. And I want to pull something out of that that really plays into what we're doing here about our connections, our personal learning networks, and the people that we've learned from. Here it is a giant wordy quote. I apologize for that, but if it's in yellow on my slides, it's important. Sometimes the most significant professional connections are people we've only ever met on the internet. I know that is true. I have friends I know that are out there right now that I mostly see online, that I talk to online, and if I'm lucky, I get to see every few years. Uh, Unplugging suggests that the selves we are online aren't authentic. That's, that, I'm not, I, I agree with that. Because I think we can have some very important relationships. So I was doing a version of this talk in Canada. And this was the moment 
where out of the audience, a lady rose up. And it's a little scary when somebody stands up while you're talking like this. And I, I did get the finger whack. <laughs> and she said, hold on. You're talking about Ian, you're talking about going to the Louvre and all this and, and phones and whatever. And she said, I want to take my iPads away from my kids and send them outside to play. I, because they are not in the moment. I said, well, I remember the summer of 1976 when my mother took the Hardy Boys book out of my hand and said, go outside and play. It's the same thing. Is it the same thing? The interesting thing to me is it is very different because the devices allow our young people or whoever to be connected to their friends. <coughs> Dana Boyd, who is doing the Brusa President's Program at ALA in just a few days, has done research for over 10 years on how young people use information technology. I would recommend this book highly if you do like a one library, one book, one staff type thing. Read this for sure, or if you work with young people, absolutely seek it out. Dana says most teens are not compelled by gadgetry as gadgetry, but by the friendships that they allow to happen. Okay, one more Ian story. And I told, I was walking with his mom this weekend. I said, you know, I talk about your son when I'm out and about running my mouth. I go out to our shed. I open the door, and Ian is sitting in there on a blanket with the iPad, texting, wasn't texting, whatever you can do on the iPad to talk to your friends and doesn't goes on Wi-Fi, not on the cellular network. He's typing, typing. I'm like, oh, Ian, what are you doing? He said, I'm talking to my friend at home. He said, I didn't, I needed some time away from all the, and all, you know, all the kids are running around and screaming. I'm like, okay, no problem. I just shut the door. Walked away and said, don't tell anybody I'm in here. <laughs> How cute is that? He was taking a break to connect with his friend at home. Like a little breather, like a little check-in. Or maybe there was something that was on his mind. Uh, I think that's uh, very beautiful and very wonderful. Boyd says what the soda shop was to a certain generation, forgive me, is what gadgets are today to a certain generation. Okay, so let's talk about the learner's experience. Uh, people expect to be able to work, learn, and study whenever and wherever they are. And this is right out of the Horizon Report. And if you're in academic libraries, always be looking at the Horizon Report each year. Very lucky to uh, uh, have worked a couple years on the library edition of the Horizon Report. We'll talk about that this afternoon in the session I have with you uh, this afternoon. So this brings me to the title of the talk. How long has it taken me to get to the title of the talk? 22 minutes. Yay. It's called Learning Everywhere. And really, I think we have come to a point where technology, mobile devices, connectivity, people, collections, libraries, everything comes together and promotes this, the idea of learning everywhere. And here's another book I'll throw at you. This is one of my favorite. I use this in my teaching. A New Culture of Learning by uh, Douglas Thomas and John Seeley Brown. Put this one on the list for sure if you haven't very quickly. Thomas and Brown say, and this is very, very close to what Friedman said, right? The world is changing faster than ever, and our skill sets have a much shorter life. I can't teach my students just how to use WordPress. I need to teach them how to use the next thing that comes out of WordPress, because they have experience with WordPress. Play is the basis for cultivating imagination and innovation. There's a first. Uh, mention of the word play, so important, uh, which brings me to the hyperlinked library. And this is a class, a model uh, of library service, and a class that I teach at San Jose uh, that explores these ideas. Hyperlinked library services are born from constant, positive, and purposeful adaptation to change that is based on thoughtful planning, what a mouthful, and grounded in the mission of the library. So it takes all this stuff, it does all this sort of environmental scanning, looks at what's happening, and then matches it up with the foundations of our profession, right? All those things that, that, we, that we get in, in library school and all those things 
that become our values as you uh, move through your career. And I got to tell you, it's not, it's, we're just not talking about technology, we're also talking about people because hyperlinks are people too. It's that simple. We can be a hyperlink between two people in the library, between, between two groups, between information and the person that needs it for whatever reason, in whatever circumstance. So people can also be hyperlinks, and that's, uh, that really resonates with me. The library helps people make sense of the world. I think that's a, a nice way to say uh, a lot of, of things we're talking about, about access and providing information. We're helping people make sense of the world. And we also call that lifelong learning. And that's a, another way to approach that. All right. So here's some different ways that we might learn in the library. And from looking at yesterday, I think you're getting some really wonderful on-the-ground experience. So this is a little bit of a review uh, as well. Uh, there's DIY learning, do it yourself. And uh, that means that the hyperlink library creates, and we might tinker, we might uh, figure out how something works. Uh, it might be contributing to the collection of the library, like North Carolina State University did at their new library, at the Hunt Library, um, where they invited students to use Instagram to take photos of their favorite awesome library experiences, places, whatever, share them with a tag, and they become part of the library's collection, and they get displayed up on the wall. Uh, the beautiful monitor wall in the library. This is Detroit Public Library, uh, the hype maker space. Uh, these young people get to take things apart, and I think that's either an old typewriter or some type of Apple computer there that they're taking apart and figuring out how it works, maybe building something new out of a bunch of pieces. One of my favorite examples uh, from Skokie Public Library, the digital media lab, uh, Talia, what's her name, she needed to do a biographical video for a class at, at Skokie High School. She did not have the technology she needed to do so. The Skokie Library has the Digital Media Lab. She knew of it, so she went there and she said, I have to do this. And they said, of course we can help you with that. So she brought in her family photos and they showed her how to scan them. They showed her how to use the Apple computers to pull all those in and make a slideshow and add cool words. And it came out so well, and she had to upload it to YouTube, the library said, could we link to your video on our blog for the Digital Media Lab? She was thrilled. Because her thing that she created became part of the library. And that's huge. Here's a test, yay for test, they had a program at uh, Westport Public Library in Connecticut, and she printed, here's a close up, um, she printed her own little, okay, I'm a big Titanic guy, so this is so cool. She printed a little Titanic. I would love to have been at that program. I would have been right there with Tess saying, let's print this thing, right? So she got to print a little Titanic, and they probably learned about the Titanic, or whatever they were doing, and that was her takeaway. I just think that's so impressive. All right, let's switch gears. We doing okay? Oh, yeah, we're doing right there. Mobile learning. The hyperlink library offers collections and access anywhere. All right. Pew Internet in American Life a handful of years ago said the mobile device will be the primary connection to the internet by 2020. I think it's sooner. I think we're almost there. I think all of us were trying to get on the hotel Wi-Fi last night, right? <laughs> because that's our primary device to get on by. <laughs> I love this. This is a study from um, uh, AOL and BBDO. I apologize, it probably looks very small for the folks following along in various places, but the thing to take away here is this was a study that identified seven primary motivations for using our phone. The most, the, the biggest one, the largest thing we do, oh this, this slide, oh this slide did get a little corrupted, that's okay. I can tell you about it. The biggest thing we do online, according to this study, is me time. Me time is all that stuff, the socializing, watching a funny video, looking at various websites, etc. What I would do for all of these things, though, like shopping, accomplishing, preparation, I would draw one more circle around it. 
And I would label that circle all the way around learning. Because I think we can learn no matter what we're doing. If we're online shopping, there's a chance you're going to learn something there. <laughs> right? Me time? Absolutely. You're one funny cat video away from learning something. I kid you <laughs> not. If you just follow your curiosity. Uh, so, <laughs> absolutely. Put learning around there. Libraries have done a good job of embracing this. The British Library has done a really good job uh, with their historical map collection app. And then there's this. Uh, I think we're finding our way to the fact that learning should happen everywhere and to do that we should have the coolest, best things we have as learning objects out in the palm of people's hands. A few years ago I got uh, that earworm song in my head, the song that was used in a movie at Traverse City Film Festival. I did all those things you do, played it a million times, read about it online, and discovered that a certain university in a southern state has the five original pages that the songwriter wrote the song out on. This is a song from the late 1960s. It's a southern gothic mystery song. Five pages of lyrics with crossed out verses. Oh, I wanted to see that, right? If you're curious, you want to see something like that, especially if you really like the song, because you want to know what else is going on in it. Looked around, looked around, couldn't find any mention online of this other than one page at a site not really related to the library, which I thought was interesting. So I played the professor card. I emailed the university archivist and I said, I'm really interested. I heard you have this. I'm really interested in this. I'm a professor. And I'm wondering <laughs> if I might get access to a digital collection. Maybe you have it, you know, just for people. Uh, maybe you could. I'm a professor. <laughs> the reply that I got back was, no, no. We could never put this online for two reasons. One, issues of preservation. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> two, issues with copyright. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Really. I would argue, I'd argue fair use, historical significance. Don't just hide something in your archives and say, ooh, how cool are we? Nobody will ever get to see it unless they go in and put on their white gloves and, and take a look. Alice, am I right? Five legal pet pages, you yes. can take pictures and like put them online like that? We could go in there ourselves. Okay. Okay, so this is a big, long story. I'm so sorry. This is a big, long story to say, take your most unique stuff and put it online because that's what people want to see. Don't spend all your time with the stuff that's already out there. Like, oh yeah, let's collect all these neat links on the web. Don't do that. Put your coolest stuff up and out there. Um, before I go on, just a thought and, and tweet this for those uh, outside of this room. What song am I talking about? Very good. Well done. Ode to Billy Joe. Why do you jump off the bridge? What did they throw off of the bridge? It's really interesting, not to, no tangents, but how that, that evening meal just devolves when the mom spills and the daughter's like, mm. you know, and then it just keeps coming out. Well, you were with Billy Joe, weren't you? It's so interesting. Okay. I'll be doing an hour on that song this afternoon. <laughs> okay, so. Out of that long story comes this question, how can the library always be within reach? And then we have to push that farther and say, how can the librarian always be within reach? Because guess what? This doesn't work anymore. We know that that doesn't work anymore. Reference numbers are falling. We need to find a way to be out. And I mean that in so many different ways. Embedded, if you will, if you want to use that word, I'm not that partial to it. Present in the community. Visible is good. I think presence and visibility are both very, very good words. Duke University does a really good job of integrating the library in their mobile app. Uh, I, you can tap on library. You can then see a map. Uh, it's a good example of a library app. I'll keep going here. We'll talk very quickly about connected learning and about giving our users a way to learn and connect. And we'll talk just briefly about this. David mentioned um, the MOOCs we taught. Massive open online courses for those 
uh, following along. There are two types of MOOCs. There's the X MOOC, which might have 20,000 people in it. And it's very much uh, sort of a solitary activity where you might consume a lecture or do something and then you write about it or you take a quiz and then you go on to the next thing. There's also C MOOCs, which, is, which are based on connectedness theory, where we come together and we learn from each other. And I was very lucky to teach, oh, look at that. Hmm. that the, I, we did a conversion uh, on the slides, and the, there's a little bit, that should say the hyperlinked library. <laughs> How interesting is that? Sorry about that. I did a version of the class I teach called the Hyperlink Library as a massive open online course in the fall of 2013. And we had almost 400, and massive has yet to be defined, uh, folks come in and learn with us and share and varying degrees of participation. And that's what I want to talk to you about. We had 363 folks, 53 did all the things they needed to do to get their certificate. This is not the be all end all of the, the MOOC story. And this is what I want you all to take away because the thing formerly known as MOOC, whatever it becomes, we will, those things would be more important than that acronym or this moment in time as MOOCs kind of go down the Gartner hype cycle into the trough of disillusionment. <laughs> we asked folks, were you successful in a post-MOOC survey? 76% of those folks yes, said yes. And they told us why. We did a big, open-ended, messy, chaotic question and said why. And we got to organize, my partner and I uh, published a couple things on this. We got to organize all those answers and found that people took away what they wanted. They knew they wouldn't get their certificate, and they never came into it for that. Just this morning in my news feeds, I saw a report coming out that although MOOCs have failed, and I'll put that in quotation marks, yeah, I don't know. K through 12 instructors, teachers, are using MOOC type things and MOOC chunks, you know, all this stuff is online in their classrooms, and that's something nobody ever thought about. So that's interesting as well. What I would say we take away from this part is we can encourage large groups of learners of all shape and size. I think large scale open learning for LIS professionals is a thing, and I think we need to continue to do that may not call it MOOC, you know, that may go away, but I think as budgets get more constrained and travel becomes harder, I think spending four or five weeks in an online learner's community with people from all over the world, having similar experiences in their libraries that you are, is a good thing. So that's why I'm harping a little bit of on large scale learning and about this, and here's a nice example of New York Public Library partnering with Penn and saying, we will help people in a room together go through the poetry book. And that might be something that libraries do as well. So there's many different ways that this might play out. And we may find that we're going to be creating our own large scale open learning opportunities. I, I tend to say large-scale open learning more now than I say massive open online course. So we're here, learning everywhere. The question is, is how do we start? How do we get going? And Twitter, for example, a few years ago used to be, what are you doing? You answer that question. I'm having a sandwich. I'm walking the dog. And now, a lot of people use Twitter. Oh, I got to sit down for a second. Ooh. A lot of people use Twitter to exchange links and learning. Maybe you participated in one of the lib chats or TLC chats or something something chats, hashtags, where you're, you spend an hour every week learning from people in your network. The Hyperlink Librarian builds a thriving, evolving personal learning network, sharing and participating. To me, this is continuous learning. And it starts with us. We need to take, whoops, uh, we need to take control of our own professional development. Okay, this is one of my favorite slides, yay. And I really believe 
we need to move toward professional development with teeth. Okay? Now, this is a great audience because you're there, because you're doing this thing, this wonderful program, where you're learning, you're growing, you're working with others. This is great. But back at the library, and if any of you are administrators or managers, we want to encourage a culture of learning all the time, but I think we also need to give it teeth. Meaning, directors, administrators have to say, you tell me how you're learning each month, how you're growing in your position. And then, we teach everyone. Okay, I want to stop for just one second. I turned in the slides a week ago, so I'm going to deviate for just a second. Let me go back here. I'll show you the scary slide one more time. We might want to aim toward being the full stack employee. And I just published my column in LJ, just went up before I got here a couple days ago, uh, called uh, Stacking the Deck. There's a model uh, from uh, the man that invented the hashtag of all things called the full stack. Full stack employees have an insatiable, insatiable appetite for new ideas, best practices, and ways to be more productive and happy. They're curious about the world, what makes it work, and how to make their mark on it. Everything about that is something that I want for my students in their professional careers. Everything about that is something I want for you all, too. And it's something I want to aim for. I want to be curious about the world. I want to wonder how things work. I want to be curious about best practices. I want to be happy. And that's a little bit of balance as well. So maybe some kind person in the room will tweet out uh, that link, or I can do it after we get done. It's at the LJ site. It's called Stacking the Deck. So being a full stack employee, then, might be a really good thing to aim at, because then, we can teach everyone how everything works. We can teach them to be curious. We can teach them how to understand how this technology works. And we can teach them how to make sense of the world. And that really points us to a time of what I see as infinite learning. And the library could be the classroom. And here's a really, really involved, whoops, there you go, where imaginations play, learning happens. That's from Thomas and Brown. Here's a really involved model called the uh, Elements of the Creative Classroom Research Model. I apologize. It has been used by the Horizon Report for a couple go-rounds. It's kind of uh, it's big and convoluted, but let's pull out some of the important things. Learning practices. Here they are. Learning by creating. We've talked about that. Learning by exploring. Trying things out. Learning by playing. Yay, there's that word again. And peer-to-peer -peer collaboration. This really is what you all are doing. And this really is what you all should aim for, for you, for your libraries, and then for helping your users to do the same. What do we need? We need to have a good understanding of emotional intelligence. And this is on the model under managing for innovation. And I really think we need empathy. We need to understand how the other person might feel. Hmm. This doesn't work. How, who are we to decide that this is not a study area? After we get done, shall we? Well, the students aren't here. If the students were here, we could go outside, we could walk around and say, this isn't a study area. You need to go in the library. <laughs> or you there, sitting by the fountain or whatever. You can't study there. In light of recent events, <laughs> the Oreos are not in This is silly. This is, this is based on the Oreo. And, have you seen the mean signs that we put up in our libraries, though? Yes. Yeah. You know, go back to your libraries when you all get done and take those things down because they're not helping anybody and they are not emotionally intelligent. Except the Oreos. <laughs> Except the Oreos, yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is, wow, look at that. Uh, user manifesto, not in a library, but in a maker space. Uh, look at this, create and innovate, always, sorry about that, always add value. Encourage others to express their thoughts and opinions. Respect others and respect the space. Those are much better things uh, to have up there. I'm sorry that looks uh, kind of odd. We have such great potential. For example, a library offers its users uh, online and in-person courses with content from community experts. Find the person in your community, be it town, campus, corporation, whatever, 
who know something super cool and build a course around it. Uh, we might call that a open, local, uh, local open online course, a LOOC, a library LOOC, if you will. Librarians support learners in our spaces and online as they create and connect because that is what we do. When we were doing our MOOCs, I was interviewed for LJ. I said a couple words about what I think, you know, libraries, what role libraries can play. Uh, and then for sure, folks, who's coming from a public library here today? Nice. In the public library, people are going to ask us questions, right, across the desk. I'm taking an online class and I have to make a video. Help! That's what we do. We help people. A comment went up on that article that said, oh, and who's going to give us all that training to do all these things that people are going to ask? Michael Stevens has obviously lost touch with his public library roots. <laughs> I have, I guess. Because I expect you, as a curious information professional, to say, I don't know how that works, but let's figure it out together. I gotta remember this is going out in this room. Okay. I'm doing a talk like this, and this lady's like, you know, it's always like, when you can't. She said, well, we can't, we can't do any of this stuff because we're still teaching people how to use mice. That is not an excuse. I think you can still show a handful of people how to use a mouse and how long are mice going to be around mm -hmm. and still be learning and growing and doing the next thing. Don't let that zero-sum idea stand in your way. Sorry. Here's some great realities, though, and I'm watching the time. We're doing pretty well. White Plains Public Library. The Raspberry Pi, which I saw Raspberry Pi go by yesterday in the hashtag and all the feeds, somebody was messing with them. White Plains gave this wonderful group of young people, although I don't really understand it, the mother of the technology, and they put it all together, and then they got to take it home with them. It's wonderful. Uh, Penn State has the One Button Studio. Professors are assigning a lot more video now in university classes. Penn State made it so you go to this area, you plug in your jump drive, you press one button to start and stop the recording, and then you take your jump drive and you have your video. And then you can edit it and do whatever you need. It's that easy, and that is important. Uh, from upstate New York comes the Better Technology Onsite and Personal Traveling Laptop Lab to rural libraries. That do not have laptops or a lab, guess what? The truck pulls in and they do now. <laughs> they unpack it in a room, in a corner of the library, and they have classes. It's a really interesting idea uh, to get technology where it's needed most. Uh, it was so interesting in Alaska to talk to the librarians up there. The issue in Alaska is there are places you can't get to in a truck. So we got to figure that out, too, and I think that should be at the top of the list for these very remote communities where the library may be a central place to learn about everything related to technology and beyond. we still got to figure out how to get them the best access that we can. This works really well for those areas that have roads. Here's the Oak Park Book Bike and this smiling Oak Park Public Library <laughs> Uh, uh, library person, how cool is this? They take the wait, 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 wait. Dave's I'm, their director. Oh, well, hello. How are you? <laughs> how cool is this? Okay. I used to live at Scoville and Harrison. Oh, jeez. At the same block as the Mazeman. Uh, yeah, for the five years I taught at Dominican. Okay, how cool is this? And this is, this is you know, whatever word it is, it's not embedded, but it's out in the community. Nice. I didn't know you were going to be here. Yeah. <laughs> Back to Johnson County, not as scary as the butchering, the story time in the park. Nice. The library partner, I know, the nice. library partnered with Parks and Rec and put a story time in the park. It's like six or eight stations. You go one to one and you read Pete the Cat from station to station, brought to you by Parks and Rec and the library. Really impressive. So 
What about us then? What I see, and I think what we saw in just these last two slides, is across all types of libraries. The librarian will be the community learning connector to support learning in so many different ways, both in physical space, virtually, through endless opportunities. So this, the librarian shaming Tumblr, or I want to replace all librarians, it said, really, this is a call to arms for us to think very strategically about our spaces, our services, and learning. And say, OK, if we need some tech-savvy librarians, let's work with the staff and get more tech-savvy and try a mobile 23 Things program or one of the other learning programs that are available. What's the key? Very quickly, being a thoughtful advocate and a reflective practitioner. Because it does indeed start with us. You can say we have the coolest library in the world with a beautiful building, but if your staff is disinterested, untrained, and does not feel comfortable, you really don't have any. Reflective practice is mindfulness to the nth degree. Sorry about that. And there's a wonderful piece from John Dewey on reflective action that says reflective action is threefold. It's open-mindedness, open -mindedness, responsibility, and wholeheartedness. That we approach our jobs with all three of these things. We're open to change. That's very full stack like. We take responsibility for our actions. <laughs> Ian's mom, I can tell you this story. Her, she had a shirt when we did our walking this past weekend that said, own it. I love that. Maybe we should all have that shirt. Own it. I'm going to own what I'm doing as a staff member. And finally, we come in with a sense of wholeheartedness. Stephen Barnes says, we must never forget that the human heart is at the center of the technological maze. I was really pleased yesterday to see in the hashtag, to see in that stream going by while I was doing my travels, how many times the heart was mentioned in the speeches yesterday from here as well as from all the different locations that are, are tweeting. And this came from one of my students in the, uh, the MOOC. Only humans can create, curate the stories, the interactions, the user experiences that make up the hyperlink library. This student took one sentence to say what's taken me almost an hour to tell you today. But really, it comes down to us and how we approach the work. So we really should aim toward technology with heart. And I have long said, and if I've done anything in all these years that I've been running my mouth, and I'm honored to be here in 2015 with you all. Years and years ago, the term Library 2.0 came and went. But one of the things that I talked about and ran my mouth about then was that the library should encourage the heart. And I still believe that, and that has not gone away. And all the things that are wrapped up in that, that we should encourage people to be the best they can be, and we should encourage them to participate and to be present and to do all those things. And that means for us that we should lead from the heart, learn from the heart, and play from the heart. And this is from Blyberg, from the Minecraft community. He, he writes about forming relationships with his users, and they are radically different than any relationship he's had with library users before. That's fascinating to me, and that's just a new avenue to explore, a new angle. This is one of my favorite examples. This is from our friends down in New Zealand. This is Christchurch Libraries. This is their Twitter page. What I love about this is right up there that you see their photographs. You see the human face of the library. I was very lucky to visit Christchurch in fall of 2013. I actually met Brendan down there in the end spend some time, they have been through two massive earthquakes mm -hmm. and they are resilient and resourceful and they continue to do things like this. Uh, <laughs> how cool is this? He was one of my <laughs> students at Dominican. He's great. Yeah, he's super cool. The human face of the library is so important. So yay to you for doing this as well. I'm so happy to pull uh, a nice Illinois example. That's Andy. Uh, super cool. Here is uh, North Carolina State. We've been talking about them a bit. This is their staff directory. What I like about this is we're starting to see the human face of the library. Everybody's name is a hyperlink to find out more about them. 
And then here's Johnson County. This, this, I love this. So cool. There's Sean up there. He's an excellent librarian. If you take your mouse and you hover over Sean's photo, another <laughs> photo is revealed. How fun is that? So fun, right? This is the human face of the library. This is the playful face of the library. Now, I understand there is a small percentage of people for legal reasons, may not want their photo online. But I am sorry. Just saying, oh no, that violates my privacy. As a library employee, that does not fly much longer because we need to see the human face of the library. As budgets change, as city government says, now what is it that you do and who are these people that work for you that we never ever see? Here's Multnomah County. What an excellent example is it. This is my librarian. This is like all these that we've seen taken to the nth degree. They are there. They're saying, here's all the stuff I'm interested in. Send me an email, and I'll put you in touch with some really cool materials. This is impressive. So what I would argue for, then, is all the things that, that David spoke about. Thank you for that introduction, too. Less professional self-questioning. Less redefining. Oh, we've got to redefine librarianship. No, we don't. We're just doing the same things. We just have better, different tools, different channels to do these things. And for sure, all of them should be performed with an open mind and an open heart. So think about your pitch. What is your pitch for what you do at the library? Oh, you work at the library, somebody might say, when you're out at the grocery store. Oh, what's your pitch? What's your 30 seconds about? Yeah, yeah, here's what's happening at the library. I think we need to practice this. Our jobs don't, start, don't stop when we leave the library. All right. So, very quickly, how are we doing? A couple, three minutes. Very quickly, what next? This is the lightning round. What does the future look like? I think we're moving toward a time of a worldwide classroom. Both for us, as library professionals, I want to see more and more global learning opportunities for us. I think they're important. As well as global learning opportunities for our constituents. Uh, we want communications technology to continue to change the world. We are going to use that every step of the way, and we're ready for the next thing, even if we don't even know what that is. Mobile technology will continue to grow, and the librarian should be with us wherever we happen to go. But the library is not going away. Sometimes I get, I get people saying, oh, you're saying the physical library is going away. You want all the books out of the library. No, I don't. The books will be in the library as long as there is ink put on paper. And then we'll have the digital versions too. The library will also be a place for people to come together. And it will be so flexible that you might be surprised from day to day what it looks like. But it's still a library. And helping our users do stuff will be so important. And we will use the latest technology to make those connections and to make them strong. And knowledge will flow and planning will be human-centered. Don't sit in a room and make library policy without thinking about the users first. Ooh, look at that. Opportunities to learn spread from the central hub to everywhere. So what now, just very quickly, and I know we're hitting our, our mark here. Uh, embrace this. Understand that chaos is a thing. Make time for exploration and learning. If you're an administrator, give time. I'm serious about this. You've got to get, have it, let it have teeth, give it teeth, and give them time. Always be learning. Never stop. Watch the horizon for the next thing. Break down barriers. Put that cool thing out on the web so people can see it, whatever that cool thing may be. Let people get in and give them access. Value, everyone. This is, I've used this a long time. It's really good because toward the end of the talk, people are like, oh, yeah, that's funny. Yeah, but can you imagine? I know. I'm like drinking iced tea up here like crazy, and if I could, I'd would, i be in trouble. Wow. Be vocal. Be a vocal, thoughtful advocate for what you want and the library. Be visible out in the community. Be nice. <laughs> Don't make a mean sign and put it on the door. Please. 
be human. Somebody comes and says, we want to try this thing that Oak Park's doing, that Johnson County's doing. We want to put everybody's pictures online. Yay, let's try it. Dress up, be funny, do something crazy. Do it. Great way to add that humanity. And know that it's okay to fail. You know, we've learned that from the gamers. Know that it's okay to make a mistake. And as much chaos as we can stand, right? It's okay. It's all right. Invite people in to plan with you, to participate with you, to create new services, and take risks. I hope in the projects that you're all working on that you will take risks. Personally, push your comfort zone. If you're sitting there like, well, I could volunteer to do that, but I don't want to do that, or maybe I should do that, raise your hand and say, I'll do that. I'll be that part of the group this time. And be creative. Be as creative as possible. Creativity and curiosity are going to be two of the most important traits of library folk going forward. And finally, bring your heart with you. Remember the heart. The heart should be the focus of everything, that encouraging the heart. And let the heart drive change. As you go forward, think about that first and foremost. I really appreciate your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you to everybody out there as well. Thank you.